This right here is the Orange Pi 5. Again, another competitor to the almighty Raspberry Pi. And this is definitely not the very first time we've checked out an Orange Pi. We checked out the Orange Pi 4 LTS as well as their integrated keyboard, the Orange Pi 800. In this video, we're gonna be talking about the specifications, some of your operating system options, and of course, can I use this single board computer to play some of my old PlayStation 2 games? As personally, emulation is my favorite use case. And just overall, is this the right board for you? So with that, we're going to go ahead and take this thing out of the box, which it just ships in a single box, wrapped up in anti-static plastic, and first, check out some of the I.O. Starting on this side here, we have a single USB 2.0 or a gigabit Ethernet. And then right here, I believe it is two USB 3.0 ports. I mean, both of them are blue, but I do question it because on the website, it says that the top one is three and the bottom is two, which would kind of be silly. Looking on this side, we have the first USB Type-C, which is for the power in. We have a audio jack, a full-size HDMI, a USB-C specifically for data, and then beside that is both some LCD panel connectors as well as a camera connector. On this side we have a spot to go ahead and put an SD card which we can boot our operating systems from. We have a on-off switch. Looking on top we have 26 pin headers. On the board there are two other buttons. This one up here by the SD card slot is a recovery key, and then this one closer to this HDMI here is actually the mask ROM key, which is part of the process of flashing operating systems to a NVMe SSD, which you could plug in right here on the back. This is the wrong size, but just for demo sake, you just go ahead and slide it on in, and it looks just like that. Obviously, you'd want to use the right size, and of course, mount it properly. For me personally, I have not had the best of luck getting an SSD to install onto this thing. They do have a full in-depth guide of how to do it step by step. A lot of the software is in Chinese, so it's kind of hard for me to go through and try to figure it out on my own. So as time goes on and more resources are out, I will definitely try that again but in my testing running off of the little micro SD card here has not given me too many issues at all probably the primary con of this board is the fact that it does not ship with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth built into the board to me personally that just seems kind of silly there is a optional little dongle here that you could plug in right into the M.2 slot here, which then has these two little antennas for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, kind of similar to the Pi 4 LTS, except for that was actually integrated into the board. There were still antennas, but yeah, I do wish that was included. So that's the board itself. Now let's talk about the specifications of this, and we're gonna start with the processor. This is probably the biggest deal. This chip right here is the Rocket Chip RK3588S. And this isn't the first time we've stumbled across this processor. It's also in the Fide Tab Duo that we checked out on the channel, as well as the Edge Pro 2, which is an incredibly highly powerful single board computer, which in turn means this is a incredibly powerful single board computer. The Edge 2 Pro has an MSRP right above $200, while you can get this computer for about $99. When it comes to the CPU benchmarks, this Orange Pi 5 here scored us a single core of 540 and a multi-core of 2244. Running Orange Pi OS, which is basically Android, scoring just barely lower than the Fide tab running Debian and the Edge 2 Pro running Ubuntu. When it comes to comparing it to the Orange Pi 4 LTS, we get about double the single core performance and just over three times the multi-core performance. And we're seeing about the same situation when it comes to the Orange Pi 800, which is roughly the same price as this, except for you get a whole keyboard with it, basically. This rocket chip, of course, is an ARM CPU with eight cores and a max frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. And then when it comes to system memory, you have options of four, eight, 16, and 32 gigabytes. This one is the eight gigabyte model, which to me is like kind of the minimum for RAM in modern computers. And this is at LPDDR4. Now with specs out of the way, we need to actually dive into an operating system and kind of test the daily use and performance. But before we do that, this video was made possible by PCBWay. PCBWay is your one-stop shop for all your full-feature custom PCB prototyping needs. Everything is incredibly affordable. You can get an instant quote right on their homepage with all the options you need, including dimensions, quantity, layers, thickness. And they actually have a new 3D printing service, including these specific materials, colors, surface finishes, and really a whole lot more. In addition to this, they have sheet metal laser cutting, CNC machining, and you can see here under products and capabilities, really everything that they could do for you. It's quite extensive, and if you're needing something, anything to do with PCBs, PCB Way is definitely 
the way to go. Actually getting Ubuntu on this with the SD card was actually a fairly easy process. For that, we were able to just use Etcher, throw it in and it booted up right away. Cool thing is I was able to use this display right here. It's a USB-C touch screen display. And it did actually just right away go ahead and recognize the fact that it was touch screen and it worked perfectly fine. One of the things that's pretty common with these types of devices is within desktop environments, there's a little bit of graphical lag. And with this, there was a little bit, but not nearly as much as like the Raspberry Pi 4. And here we can see some of the specs, including the eight core CPU. And here it says it's reading at 1.8 gigahertz instead of the advertised max of 2.4. And then of course we can verify that this is in fact the eight gigabyte model. After that, I went ahead and opened up Chromium just to kind of test the general web browsing experience. Went ahead and opened up our newsletter, scrolled through it, everything worked perfectly fine. Then we opened up YouTube, opened up stats for nerds so we can see what's going on. And playing at 4K, it was, it was a little stuttery, but it was playing, which is cool. At 4K, we were seeing about 60 of 800 frames dropped. Bumping it down to 1440p was really smooth with about a frame dropped every three or 400 or so. And then 1080p was absolutely crispy with no frames dropped. From there, I tested some actual production applications, first being Caden Live, threw in some random video files, threw on a couple effects and transitions, rendered out a 1080p video, and the render times were roughly the exact same duration as the actual video. Which for rendering off of a little thing like this is fairly decent. And opening up HTOP just to see how hard it's truly working, it was, oh, definitely working at about 80 to 100% CPU utilization during render. And when we're not really doing anything, we see CPU usage anywhere from zero to 10% and RAM usage at just about 800 megabytes. And just kind of test and see how hard the CPU is working during the YouTube playback. I opened that back up running 1440p. Everything was right around the 50% mark and then dropping it down to 1080p. CPU utilization fell to about 30 to 40%. Running an application like GIMP gave us no problem at all. First thing I did was open up a lava render, rendered out pretty quick. And then I just played around with some text moved it around. We don't really have real time manipulation. There's a very slight delay in the text following the cursor, but really nothing that uh, you can't work around. But from there, we come across a issue. And that is that in the Ubuntu environment, GPU hardware acceleration at the moment is basically non-existent which is probably a kernel issue as far as I'm aware of and a DRM driver issue. Hopefully somehow Rocket Chip, Orange Pi, and all these developers kind of work together to make sure all the hardware actually works, that'd be nice. But I am pretty sure something like this is going to just get fixed with time. Now where this isn't an issue at the moment is in Android. Actually installing Orange Pi onto the SD card here was a little bit more involved as you had to use their custom firmware software to flash it but it was definitely a lot easier than trying to flash a uh, NVMe SSD. <laughs> when it comes to the base operating system, it's not really anything too special other than just Android with the Aurora store, some custom theming and branding. The file manager that was pre-included kind of sucked, so I just ended up getting Google's file manager. And when it comes just to general everyday use, there wasn't anything too exciting or special beyond the Android experience. As a matter of fact, because of the unusual interface, a lot of the uh, games and stuff that I tried to download from the Aurora store just simply would not work when it comes to actually using input with the system. And getting the touch screen that I was using was also a hit or miss. It would work right away if you touched the screen right away, but as soon as you clicked a mouse or a keyboard for some reason, it would just ignore that completely. And it is important to note that Orange Pi OS currently is in beta. So when it has a official release for this hardware, hopefully it's a little bit better. But with that, the few games I did get running ran really good. I got this kind of Minecraft knockoff game to run really well, and then I went ahead and jumped straight into some PS2 emulation. By the way, the developer of unfortunately recently stepped away from the project. Basically, he was kind of tired with uh, the negativity that surrounded his application, which really sucks. It is fantastic software, as I was able to get multiple games running really well. Nearly all the games that I loaded up were very playable and overall it was a really good experience other than those title bars that I couldn't get to go away. If you know how to do that, let me know. There were some slowdowns here and there such as first starting a race in Need for Speed. It was kind of slow to get going but after that it caught up and it was running at normal frame rates. So ultimately in terms of hardware, 
It's all here, except for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And speaking of that, I forgot to mention, this dongle thing didn't work in Ubuntu, so I had to use this uh, TP-Link USB thing, worked perfectly fine. This didn't work in Android, but this worked perfectly fine. As I was saying, when it comes to power and performance, the hardware is here. It's just a matter of the software trying to catch up to the hardware that we have available to us. And honestly, it's really getting to the point that devices like this, I would much rather pick over something like the Raspberry Pi 4. Just the power to performance is ridiculous compared to the Pi. Granted, the Pi community and the Pi software availability will always win hands down. It looks like the Pi 4 is selling on Amazon for about $100 and $60 with this being $99. Making a purchase decision, this is like a, a clear winner, unless if there's a very software specific reason that you want to go ahead and purchase a Raspberry Pi. I just really hope the Raspberry Pi 5, which hopefully will be coming out soon, has the hardware and capabilities to at least compete with this, in terms of the hardware, of course. With all that, of course, there'll be links to purchase that down below, as well as a link to the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay. Big thank you for watching this video. If you disagree with me completely, please let me know down below. With all that, have a beautiful day and goodbye.